Uh, well, thank you for the introduction and thank you for the opportunity to, to speak. Uh, I recognize some of the faces that actually did participate in, in, in our experiments. And if you don't, you know, please talk and then we can, you know, maybe at least show you the, you're going to be doing a tour of the, uh, of the SNL. They already did. They already did. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, and I want to up front apologize for the group that got left behind on Monday. <laughs> I just didn't know that you have to return uh, for dinner by six. Um, okay. Uh, so the outline of the talk is, is, is fairly standard, you know, uh, and the, uh, as, I, as uh, the title uh, suggests, we're going to be talking about the neutron spin echo spectroscopy and let's do. So in a nutshell, uh, what NSC does, you know, that's the orbital view. It, it, it measures the very small velocity changes in a sample by using neutron magnetic moment as a clock. And uh, <laughs> there has been some um, remarks about uh, or allusions to, to spin echo. Roger Pinn is actually one of the world experts on spin echo. So, uh, and I, I hear that Chuck, Mike Chuck also mentioned some, some of the thing. The, the end product of, of what you get out of the experiment is so-called intermediate scattering function, IQT, which is a Fourier transform of the scattering function SQ omega, where omega is the energy change. Um, we can use relatively broad wavelength band uh, while maintaining very good resolution, so that's, that's an advantage. Uh, for that fourth bullet point is mostly, I guess, for soft matter people. It's typically used in conjunction. The NSC is used in conjunction with, with say, SANS, where you get, in sort of broad strokes, you get a structure from SANS and you get the dynamics from, from NSC. Uh, the, the drawback uh, is that uh, NSC is, is counting intensive, so it takes a um, long time to, 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 to run experiment, typical experiments at Spinnaco run at least on our machine run anywhere between, say, a week or two weeks. Five days is unusually short. You have to have a really good sample. And it requires fairly large samples, so, uh, you know, milliliters. So for some biologists, that's often a, a, a problem. So that's the sort of orbital view of, of what we do. Now from marketing, we go to zoology. So that uh, graph here shows the time scales you can probe with X-ray neutron uh, uh, instrumentation. This is the, the length or the, the wave vector. So this is stolen from European Splation Search because it nicely features spin record right in the middle. Uh, so you can, you can see that it kind of extends the, what's available from inelastic uh, uh, scattering um, techniques to uh, uh, slower, uh, slower times and, you know, fits in the, the, the resolution domain of, say, tens of angstroms uh, right in the middle. So what you can study with, with NSC is, is uh, lots of soft matter uh, problems. You can also uh, study motion of hydrogen and it's been even applied to, to magnetic systems like, you know, spin glasses. From zoology going to geography. So this is uh, just a, a map that shows all the, at least I, I tried to put most of the existing Spinnaco instruments uh, were here in Tennessee. There is another very nice Spinnaco instrument at National Institute of Science and Technology in, in Maryland. Um, and there are a bunch of those instruments uh, in Europe, most prominently at Institut Lau et Langevin in Grenoble the IN11, the very first uh, spin echo instrument that was built, and IN15 that currently holds the record of the highest resolution. Um, so this is the list of uh, uh, instruments that, that, that exist. The, the, the top part is this, what I will explain later, classic IN11 type. The two of them that are underlined, uh, you notice that there is this ULIC thing here. Uh, the instrument here is actually operated by by uh, German Research Center Ulich in Germany. That, that's why the, and uh, these, these logos here. And so the, the Ulich Research Center op operates two of them. One is the, the one that we, we, we have here in Oak Ridge. The other one they have in, in, in a reactor in Garching, which is near Munich. They also have some share of the, the two 
uh, instrumented uh, ILL, the, the IM11 and the IM15. Um, okay. So uh, the principles of neutron spin echo. So in a, in a in elastic neutron scattering, what you probing the, uh, the, 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 the spectral response of a sample. Oh, sorry. Okay. I guess it can be done in five seconds. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, the cross section is, is proportional to the, to the scattering function, often called the dynamic structure factor. And uh, in order to get to high resolution in, in, in omega, you, uh, you know, this is the, the, the usual kinematic formulas. You have to measure precisely the, the incoming neutron or prepare the incoming neutron velocity or, and measure the outgoing neutron velocity, which means that because uh, it's very hard to build a monochromatic uh, neutron source, which means you have to throw out most of the neutrons to just to get a very narrow uh, line of uh, energy uh, of the incoming neutron. So the, the way out of it, and this, this is how most of the quasi-elastic instrument work, like you know, uh, CNCS or backscattering, uh, they just uh, have to remove all the, most of the neutrons just to get the resolution. The way out of it is to use, hmm. must have some, maybe I should step away from it. Uh, the way out of it uh, is uh, to use neutron magnetic moment, and if you put a magnetic moment of any kind, in this case neutron, it could be proton, in a magnetic field, uh, it follows the, the so-called block equation, it precesses. As long as the ma uh, spin or magnetic moment is not parallel to the magnetic field, and it precesses with the Larmor frequency that is given by, by the strength of the magnetic field and, and, and a gyromagnetic ratio that's given different for different particles. Uh, and in case of neutron, that gyromagnetic ratio is roughly 30 megahertz per Tesla. So it, in a one Tesla field, a, a neutron will precess 30 million times a second. So that's, that's, that's the real uh, underlying, uh, I'm sorry, hello. So now for me to learn the, the, the spin echo, I, I went back to the original paper, the, the, the spin echo was invented by, by a, a Hungarian physicist, uh, Ferenc Mezei, in 1972, so long, long time ago. Um, and in that paper, he started with, uh, with just a, you know, a, a simple experiment. You just polarize neutrons however you want to do it. You have the black box that puts those neutrons uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a perpendicular to, uh, direction, their spin in perpendicular direction to to the magnetic field, and they will start precessing. And you can, you, you, have, you have the analyzer, and then you can move that whole thing. And so if you keep moving that thing, the projection of the spin as you, as you move along uh, changes, and you get this cosine type oscillations. This, this basically, this, is, this was done for, for 1.6 angstrom neutrons and a very low field, maybe you know, 16 gauss, or something like this. Um, 160, 1.6 millitesla. And then this period of oscillation is in, uh, in, is in centimeters. So you, you, you get these nice, you can actually, you can actually see it, you know, with, with our field that we have and the neutrons that we have, the, the period of oscillation would be about 50 microns. So that, 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 that's um, slightly different. So, sorry. Okay. Um, so you need, some devices, and uh, you probably heard of them uh, during the course of lectures, that to, to manipulate the spin. And uh, there are lots of uh, these things. The, the ones we use at, at our spin echo are the so-called mesai flippers that, that, uh, that use the precession to, 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 to either flip the spin 180 degrees. So let's say the, you have the, uh, that black box represents uh, just wires wound up, and so this uh, red, arrow points to the, to the effective magnetic field. If a neutron comes into, into a, a, a region of the field that, that points back uh, up, it will just precess 180 degrees. So you have, that, that, that is the 180 or pi flipper, what we call. If your field points at, say, about 40, 45 degrees, it will do this 
pi flip ar around that axis, but effectively what will happen is, is just you, you will get 90 degree flip. So that's, that's, these are the spin manipulation devices that we use uh, um, in, in spin echo. So now, um, sorry, I should. Um, we kind of go back to this, to, this, to this first experiment or this uh, picture that I showed in two slides ago. We just kind of leave the, you know, leave the neutrons processing in a, in a uniform magnetic field. So the accumulated phase is just proportional to the time the neutron spends flying in that field the, uh, and to the Larmor frequency. And if you remember, Larmor frequency is just gamma times b, uh, b field. And then the time spent is just the length of the magnetic field over velocity. So um, you can write it down using uh, something called J, which is the what we call field integral. That's the relevant parameter of every spin echo, which is this, the product of the magnetic field and the length of the coil, or more precisely, it's an integral over, over that because the magnetic field might not be totally uniform. Um, so for example, for eight angstrom neutrons, the, the magnetic field we, we can easily achieve in our uh, and our coils and the length of our coil is about 1.2 meters. The, the neutron will do uh, about 30,000 precession. I noticed that on the slides I posted, there's actually a, a, an error. It should be four, not five. So this one is correct. I'll, I'll update the, the slides. Okay, I see this one is less touchy. So I guess we're ready to, 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 to talk about uh, sp spin echo. Uh, so using all those devices to manipulate the spin and the fact that the spin, uh, neutron spin does precess in a magnetic field. Uh, the, the, the general outline of, a, of, a, of a, what we call classic ion 11 type spin echo is we have two precession zones, two big coils uh, you know, around the sample. And then at the, at the entrance, neutrons are polarized, po polarized uh, along the beam. And then we have the pipe flipper that flips them 90 degrees up and it starts the clock, starts the precession. So they precess. And as they precess, they, uh, each of those neutrons might have slightly different uh, velocity. That means that, that at the end of the, uh, uh, the first curl, they sort of precess and then their spins sort of you know, diverge. Then we do the 180 degree flip and they precess backwards and then we, they, we recover the spin at the end uh, of, the, of, the, of the second curl and we do the pi half flip and then we can analyze it. So that's, that's the echo. So that's sort of shown here without me, my clumsy hands, you know, the, you, you prepare the, the spin like this, they, they start to precess because they have different velocities. They, their spin at the end of the second coil, first coil, sorry, is slightly different. We do the pi flip and then sort of un, uh, un, unwind now back to the, back to the original uh, polarization state. And that's, that's the name echo because we, 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 we get, we prepare and then we sort of echo back. It's very reminiscent to, uh, to something that people who know I'm an NMR, I'm not one of them. There is something called NMR echo, which, which, which we, you know, that, that the name spin echo actually comes from, from NMR. And then uh, that graph simply shows the, 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 how the polarization of the ensemble of neutrons kind of looks in a, in a, in a in a, in, a, in a spin echo. So we, we start, let's say, 100% polarized like this, and then they start to precess, then they get depolarized. They are, you know, lose their polarization around, around the sample totally, and then by time flip, uh, not time flip, uh, the pi, uh, spin flipping, you know, they, they recover, and then we, 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 we measure the, uh, the, um, the signal at the detector. And that, that looks very much like a signal. So a careful observer notices that we have this extra yellow box here and then it's here for a reason because the echo the the echo condition means that the um, number of precession in in, a, in, a, in that coil and that coil is exactly the same so what you know you try to build them as precisely as you can but uh, and to put the current exactly as you can but what you do is have a little small coil wound up in our case inside uh, the big coil and you just scan that current so you could either you know move the shrink and or, or uh, elongate the coil which is hard to do or you just add the subtract current and that's how you how you scan uh, how you scan uh, uh, how you get the symmetry how you get the echo 
And so if you put a sample now in that has some line width, that will, that will, that will, the neutrons will either gain or lose some of the energy, and so you won't get a, a, a perfect echo. Some of these neutrons will, will end up at, 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 at uh, spin vectors, you know, in, in, in a direction different than, say, vertical, and then what you measure is the, the loss of polarization, or reduced spin echo. And that loss of polarization is, uh, is something that, that corresponds to the energy loss uh, at the sample. And that's, that's, that's sort of the, the, the crux of the, of this, of this spin echo. Um, if there's any questions, we can stop or we can have uh, some, yeah, the question? No? Okay, it's okay. Or we can have some questions at the end. Um, so now, a little bit more math, uh, just to, so we're working in a so-called quasi-elastic regime, so the, the energy changes are very small. And then the accumulated phase in the first coil and the second coil, if you write them down using those equations from, from prior slides, is um, it's like this. And uh, the condition is that the, the, the field integral in both si on both sides of the of the of the um, um, of both arms, I guess, uh, is, is the same. And then the, what what matters is the difference in velocity. So if you work it out, you get this complicated formula. But what's really important is that uh, that this this part, so gamma over two pi j lambda to the power third, we call it the Fourier time that corresponds to to the to the to the energy in uh, in in, in a, in elastic uh, instrument, and that change of the phase is, is just the product of the Fourier time and, uh, and the energy change of that, that occurs in the sample. So then we can see that in order to get to high resolutions, we, we can either increase J, which is, means high field, or it's much cheaper to, to well, much cheaper, I guess, it goes much steeper, sorry, uh, with, with, a, with, a, with a neutron wavelength. So, you know, by just doubling neutron wavelength, we can octuple, sorry, uh, the, 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 the range in, in for our resolution. So in the bottom is just for some curious people that um, that that whole factor that is, it's, it's in front of J and lambda is, amounts to something like 0.2 in units. The, the Fourier time would be in nanoseconds, the field integral in Tesla meters, and the neutron wavelength in angstroms. So if you work it out, the for eight angstrom neutrons and the field integral that we have, maximum field integral we can have in our spectrometer, the, 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 the Fourier time for those eight angstrom neutrons is about 50 nanoseconds. That corresponds to the energy change of say uh, 10 nanovolts. So this is really high resolution uh, uh, spectrometer. And so uh, now we're going to go to talk about a little, what we actually see is that that um, the, the different, uh, the, the phase change is proportional to the uh, Fourier time uh, times the omega. And what we see in a detector is the, is the sort of ensemble average, so the cosine of, of, of that, uh, of that uh, phase difference, if you will. And uh, I spare you the mass, this I realize it's somewhat a hand-waving argument, but if you, if, you, if you write it carefully, the signal in the detector is sort of looks like this. The, the average part is proportional to the, to the static structure factor, and the amplitude of these oscillations is, uh, looks like a, like a cosine or real part of the Fourier transform of the uh, scattering function. So what we measure is a, is a Fourier transform of the SQ omega, what we call intermediate scattering function. And then if you work up that that it's proportional to the amplitude of a, s a echo signal. And you have to normalize it to, some, uh, to the beam polarization. So we typically do two measurements in addition uh, to just measuring the echo. We just switch off those pi half flippers and just let the beam go through the detector. That's our, what we call, up signal. Uh, that's 100% well, you know, whatever the polarization is, is available. And then, still with those pi half flippers off, we, we just turn on the pi flipper. That's what we call spin down. We should see, in principle, nothing but, uh, you know, there is some depolarization. There is some scattering in the instrument. That's our down signal. So that's our normalization. So that, in the end, 
for every little wiggle, echo group, whatever you want to call this uh, thing, we, we, we get uh, the normalized uh, uh, intermediate scattering function that just uh, is calculated according to this very simple algebraic formula. So the amplitude, uh, two times amplitude over up minus down. That's, that's, that's the, that's the um, in a nutshell, the, the reduction process uh, uh, that gets you to the, uh, to the, to the end product. And uh, most of our, mo most of, not our, most of the spinnaker instruments uh, are built on reactor sources where the, the monochromatization is, is, is still pretty good. It's about, say, 15, 20 percent. And what they, what they do is then they can just measure four points uh, along the echo group, and then using this simple algebra, they get the, the amplitude and the average, uh, uh, and that's it. Um, in addition to the up and down signal, they, they're, they're done. Uh, our instrument uh, is built on a, on a pulse source and we take much broader uh, uh, wavelength band, up to say 50%. And you can see on, 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 on this graph, it's called by some an Atari plot. On the vertical axis, you have a neutron wavelength going from say five to eight angstroms. And on this is the, the current in the phase coil uh, uh, that, 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 that you use to scan. And you can see that clearly that that the period of oscillations for, say, five angstrom neutrons is, is different from the eight angstrom neutrons. So we cannot just measure uh, every 90 degrees uh, for one wavelength because it won't be the same uh, for, the, uh, for the other neutrons. So we typically measure more points. The advantage of this is that, that if it's more monochromatic, uh, the, the, this uh, damping of oscillation is, is, is much, much smaller because the envelope of this, uh, I should have said that, it's, it's a Fourier transform of the, of the incoming uh, neutron wavelength spectrum. So if you have a broad spectrum that, uh, let's say it looks like a box, you got a, a sine x over x type of um, envelope. So see that, that those neighboring minima are uh, maxima, so are much smaller than, than say, if you just took a smaller uh, wavelength band. Uh, okay. So uh, this uh, Fourier transform is actually quite kind of quite useful to to for data reduction and interpretation. Here I wrote backscattering, but it could mean really any inelastic uh, uh, scattering. So for um, for for an instrument, say like BS, uh, backscattering basis, for example, you your instrument has this intrinsic resolution uh, that's just nature of the instrument, this denoted here by the blue, blue curve. Your, your signal from your sample, the SQ omega, is, 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 is here denoted as a, uh, as a green curve. And then what you really measure is a, is a convolution of the two. So the signal in the detector is, is broadened by the, by, the, by, the, by the instrument resolution. So in order to get to SQ omega, you have to deconvolute, which is not difficult, but it's, it's tedious. Uh, the nice thing about Fourier transform that it converts the convolution just a simple product. So we typically measure resolution on our instrument using some sort of uh, elastic scatter. Most typically it's a, it's a, it's a carbon uh, or, uh, or aluminum oxide or, or, or tizer. And then we measure our sample. That's the green curve. And all we do is just divide I over R, I'm sorry, the, what we measure is the, the, the red curve and we just divide the, the, red, cur the red values by, by the resolution and we get IQT directly. Uh, so that how the sort of data reduction in a nutshell uh, looks. We, we, we measure, uh, this is actually the data that we took with the Monday group, so it's really fresh. Um, we, we have, we, we measure these echo groups for different pixels on our detector, and then, um, and then they got converted to the, to the final product, if you will, this uh, SQ uh, tau. And then here's the sort of the canonical procedure. So you first measure resolution for two things, to get the resolution itself and also to get the symmetry phase. So make sure that you're, 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 you're scanning around the, the echo point. Then you measure your sample you get the same, uh, same thing. Often you, you want to measure either background or if you're interested in a system that, that has some solution or, 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 or some other components in it, 
you want to subtract that from, so you want to just see the dynamics of, of, of some particular uh, parts. So you, you measure background, or we call it sometimes buffer, and you do the same thing. And then you get, in the end, uh, so you, you got a corrected signal um, uh, intermediate scattering function, and then you, you compute IQ of tau for every pixel, you, you, and you group them according to Q and tau, and you get these nice curves. So that's, that, 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 yeah, that, that's uh, in a nutshell the, the, the data reduction. The complications, um, so they are complications, but it can be used to your advantage. So uh, the first thing is that, uh, as you've learned, there are two types of scattering in, in general. You can have a coherent scattering, where, which in this case, the spin of the neutron is preserved, and this is typically a good thing. And then you have incoherent scattering, which uh, perceives that, that it, the neutron has a 30% chance of preserving its spin and two-thirds uh, chance that it will uh, get spin flipped. Um, that's a good thing or a bad thing because you can say um, most of the time we, uh, we would measure coherent scattering alone and just minimize incoherent scattering. So we just have uh, coherent. So here's the, the, the sort of general expression for the, for the, for the echo amplitude. So it's some... Um, intensity times some dynamics that's coherent or incoherent. But you, if you just can cross this out, you're just looking at this. Or uh, in case if you're, it's a more difficult experiment, but if you say you want to look at hydrogen, this is now very small and this dominates. It just happens that your signal is shrunk by, by 30%, which means you have to count longer, um, but it's not impossible to do. Another complication is that, so this is a cross-section of the, the, the main solenoid. So that, that field integral is all nice and dandy if you follow the, uh, the, the symmetry of the solenoid. But we know that uh, the solenoid field in, in axis uh, in, uh, on a perpendicular to, to its symmetry axis varies sort of like a R square. So if you have a neutron that, that goes straight or at an angle, it will see slightly different field integral, and then you will lose your echo, you will uh, depolarize. So the solution is uh, put some glasses on, uh, what we call them correction coils, that have current distributions that are thin pieces of, uh, of aluminum with the current distributions that varies as an R squared. There's different types, and I'll show you the ones that we actually, uh, we actually use. So that, that, those correction coils ensure the uniformity or homogeneity of the magnetic field inside the main solenoid. Question? Oh, I thought I saw someone raising hand. Maybe he was dozing off. Um, so the spectrometer that I showed you on that slide back a few minutes ago, that's what we call ion 11 type. So you have two solenoids, uh, pi half flippers on, on both ends and a pi uh, flipper in, in, in the middle. That's called ion 11 type for the reason that the first uh, instrument that was built of that sort was ion 11 at ILO in Grenoble. That was built in late 70s. It still exists and still is in operation. And uh, I believe Roger Penn and uh, Chuck Mikeshack mentioned the um, different types of. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. So. Of spin echo instrumentation, the one I want to mention is that, uh, in principle, in that, in that ion eleven type of experiments, your ma your sample has to be non-magnetic. So whatever you put in the middle has to be non-magnetic because it will depolarize the beam. There are exceptions. You can put a paramagnetic uh, sample, for example. It, in this case, your sample is the flipper, so that that sample will will, will act as a pi flipper. Uh, so you don't need the, the, the pi flipper, and then the, the echo signal is proportional to the magnetic scattering. With the, with the um, complications, I guess, that, that, the, that, that the spin that is polarization that's parallel to the scattering vector just gets flipped by 180 degrees, and then the one that's proportional is just uh, get, gets cut, cut in half. And if you want to read more, this is the, the, the reference. We have an in-house expert on, on the uh, magnetic um, uh, scattering. Gare Geller is, is, is probably one of the leading experts in, in, the, in, the, in the field uh, on magnetic spin echo. 
there is also what I call non-standard, if you're one of the instrument scientists on them, it's nothing non-standard, it's just the, the way you, you use it. So you can have, instead of uh, solenoid fields, you can have uh, RF fields to, to do the precession. The, the, the advantage is that, that you can put then non-magnetic sample, uh, magnetic sample in, inside. Or uh, what I believe uh, Roger mentioned, because this is his, uh, one of the favorite subjects, uh, you can, by tilting the field, you can encode the scattering angle and get something called spin echo, uh, small angle, spin echo encoded small angle scattering. They would deserve lecture on their own, so I'm just gonna mention them. So it's not only IN11 type spin echoes that exist in the world, you can have a different variation on the theme, I guess. So we're gonna now talk about the, the spectrometer that we have here in the house. Uh, it's called SNS NSC. It's on beamline 15 in, in, in a target building. Some of you have, uh, have seen it either on a, during the tour or, or done the experiment. Um, as I said, it's operated by the uh, German Research Center or Forschungszentrum Jülich, uh, which is near Cologne in Germany. And this is the first one that was, and the only one so far, that has been on a, built on a, a spallation source. So that's how it looks like uh, if you guys been in the cave, uh, what we call the cave, you can see that we can move the, uh, move the spectrometer back and forth. The real estate is somewhat, uh, somewhat uh, in price for our spectrometer. So if you wanna go to high scattering angles, we push it all the way back if, if you're care more about intensity, you push it further upstream. You can see uh, that unlike most of the spin echo uh, uh, instruments, we have four choppers to select bandwidth because we're operating on a, on a pulse source. And this little green box uh, represents our polarizer. That's where the neutrons get polarization. Uh, and then they, they, they travel through the neutron guides and, and go into the spectrometer. Uh, as I said, ours is this ion 11 type, so we have two precession coils. The, the unique feature of this uh, spectrometer is this the first one that, that was built using superconducting coils. So the typical neutron wavelength that we can deliver is anywhere between two to 14 angstroms. We could in principle go higher, it's just the flux goes really uh, low. The, the, the wavelength band uh, is anywhere between two and a half and 3.6 angstroms, depending on, on, the, on, the, on the position of the spectrometer that, that, you, um, that you operate. Uh, the maximum field integral is about 0.56 Tesla meters and the scattering angle varies between three and a half to say 80 degrees. So when we move the spectrometer, see there's these little things, the neutron guys, you cannot see them, but they are suspended on cables. So we have to lift them up and then the whole spectrometer can move uh, uh, back and forth uh, depending where we need it. The sample environment is located here. Here you see a cryostat. We have also um, uh, other sample environments. Most of, our, uh, inst no, instrument. Most of our experiments are soft matter, so we typically use something called the temperature forcing system, which is visible here. That can, the advantage of this is that uh, we can load two samples at a time, and, and typically if you just don't need any um, the temperature ranges between zero and 100 Celsius. So if, you're, if, you're, if your problem falls into that range, it's just much more convenient to, uh, to operate that. Uh, we have other types of sample environment. If, if needed, we can, we can talk about it, but uh, the cryostat and the T temperature, forcing system, temperature forcing system are sort of bread and butter, what we do. Uh, as I said, this is the, the first, uh, spin echo that was built with superconducting coils. So what you really see is not the coils, but the cryostats and the coils are inside. And we use six correction coils, three in each, uh, three in each uh, spectrometer arm, which are what we, what they are called Pythagorean or Pythagoreic correction coils. Basically, they uh, have current two separate sheets of uh, current distribution, one in vertical and one in horizontal plane that you know, combine into this R square type uh, current distribution that you want to uh, have in order to correct for the um, inhomogeneities in the, in, the, in the magnetic field. Uh, another unique feature of this uh, 
instrument is that any type of spin echo measurement is very sensitive to electromagnetic noise. So, for example, if you're at NIST or if you're at ILL or if you're in Garsh, if the crane moves overhead, you pause your measurement because that will just destroy your echo. Uh, German engineers decided it's uh, worth trying magnetic shielding uh, the whole spectrometer. So it's about 2 million euros worth of new metal surrounding that, that detector. This is a cross section of, of, of our cave. What, it, what, it, what it's really good for is that these are two measurements of the same spectrometer setting. Uh, you know, Q was about 0.14 inverse angstroms, Fourier time 50 nanoseconds. That is the, the field integral that we use. They are two days apart, and there was a maintenance day. So there was obviously some activity in the cave and in the, in the target building. And these two spectra are shifted just by uh, 0.05 micro tesla meter that um, in, in terms of neutron precession it amounts to one degree so this is a very stable instrument so uh, I think it's 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 really nice feature of this of this instrument the the, the, the magnetic shielding around it okay so we're getting to some examples uh, what you can do with um, spin echo we'll have two historical examples that the first one is this so-called SDS mice cells that we, we've been doing with the students here. Uh, the other one is uh, something called reptation model. And then I'll show several recent results from, uh, from our uh, spin echo. So um, this goes back to, you see, 1981 is this, uh, there was a, the, the, the mice cells have this chains with hydrophilic and hydrophobic uh, ends. And then at some concentration, they form these, these uh, these spheres that, that they're called my cells. And then this was the very first measurement that was done. Something is trembling. Uh, uh, with, with the spin echo, and these are the ve one of the very first uh, spin echo data that came out of any spin echo. And then you can write down uh, for, for, for their effective diffusion, the, the translational diffusion, uh, the formula that kind of looks like this, uh, just next single exponent with the effective diffusion coefficient, Q squared times T, and then you can work it out, the effective diffusion coefficient is some free uh, D0 times hydrodynamic factor and, and, and a static structure factor. And then you can, you can, you can compare your data to th those two, plots. two top plots are from, 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 from a sense measurement, and this is the, this effective diffusion as a function of Q measured at spin echo. So that's what we've been doing uh, with our students, except when we plot this, we plot it upside, uh, that other plot is upside down, but we, we pretty much got that result that was measured, I don't know, 40 years ago. Uh, yes? So this is, this is, this is the data from that, uh, uh, from that, uh, so this is sun's data. This is just the IQ, right? The uh, intensity, right? You got this peak here. Well, you, you, if you add salt, I think it smears out uh, the, the th This one is probably is, yeah, yes. Well, we, the ones that we measure has about 5% concentration by weight and uh, some addition of salt. The other one is, 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 a, is, a, is a result from, say, tw uh, 15 years ago that was uh, measured by, by, by Yuli Group is this so-called uh, test of reptation model. So uh, I'm not going to go into detail, but basically it, the, there is this model of, uh, of, a, of a polymer that is called Rouse model that, looks, uh, that treats a, a polymer as a sort of free chain. And there was a competing model by, by, by the Gen that uh, treated the motion of a of a um, of a polymer in this 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 these tubes. That's why it's called reptation model. And um, the curves here, the the blue curves show the prediction of the Rouse model, and the green ones show the prediction of the Gen models. And these measurements were done at uh, Grenoble, uh, you know, 15 years ago. And then they clearly show the the, the agreement with with uh, with the, the Gen model and disagreement with with the with the Rouse model. Yes. Yeah, that, that right. So the, the the these three examples are fairly recent. This one is actually published this year. Um, 
they, uh, the group of uh, Sharma studied the, 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 the influence of the aspirin on the, on the, on the uh, membranes. And they found, uh, in, in, so this is the, the raw data that they got. And they, they found that the, you can model membranes, I should probably back out, uh, dynamic response uh, by, by so-called zilman granik model, which is like this, is just an exponent with a, with a power of two-third. And then you can r uh, further infer from the bending modulus, the, uh, from this G-band, gamma band, the bending modulus, the scapa. And that's what people are after. That means pretty much how stiff the membrane is. So by adding aspirin to the, um, to the, to the membrane, they found out it's, 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 it's softer. And that's the sort of general nutshell. Um, you can also tell that this uh, bending gamma band kind of goes like a Q to the power of three. So you, you, that's actually fairly easy to interpret the data. And then if you plot them as a gamma over Q3, you get these horizontal lines. And so you can get the bending modulus. That's one, one example. The other one is sort of similar, except they, they used this contrast matching. So the various m matching contrast in this uh, studying the, 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 the of the different lipid domains. And, and then by, by this contrast matching, they were able to look at different parts of, if you will, of, of, of those, of those uh, of those domain, lipid domains, and that's that's a result that was published two years ago, uh, and again the same zilman granik model that they that they used to 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 interpret the data. Uh, you can do something much more uh, much more complicated. Uh, uh, one of our collaborator, uh, Laura Stingach, oh, she's an instrument scientist, and this instrument she does lots of biology, and uh, you could even um, study the motion of the of the antibodies in in uh, in, uh, in solutions, and then you can write down your intermediate function uh, as a as a product. I mean, I'm not going to go into detail. I, I don't claim I uh, know a lot about this, but what it, what I'm trying to convey here is that that you can uh, have fairly complicated models because they 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 they, they, they kind of model this inter uh, internal internal motion by so-called uh, normal modes, and you can do some 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 fancy uh, data. Uh, interpretation uh, with with uh, with uh, with measurements we, we can do here, and last but not least, it's just a it's preliminary. I should strike preliminary. We 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 recently started uh, uh, exploring uh, the cap possibilities to measure magnetic magnetic uh, excuse me I think I need magnetic samples um, with our spectrometer. And this is the this um, the preliminary measurement that's gonna you know there's lots of curves here but the 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 the, the spin echo measurements are kind of here kind of fill, fill in between the gap between inelastic scattering and and their bench top uh, susceptibility measurement. Um, yeah, that's some complicated formula, but but what I'm trying to again say is that w we can do we can do paramagnetic measurements. We need to. Uh, probably invest a little bit more in sample environment, but but um, but in general speaking, we, we can do that. So in in summary, uh, the NSC is a high resolution neutron spectroscopy. Uh, measures very slow, small uh, uh, energy changes or very slow processes. Uh, the end product, if you will, is the intermediate scattering function S Q tau. I apologize because. In our business, we're kind of sloppy, so often we just, instead of writing IQ tau, is, we write SQ tau. It's, it's the same thing as just people are not very consistent. Uh, what we need is a large samples and requires some scattering intensity, but we're in user program, write a proposal. Our instrument is the first one at the spallation source, the first one with the superconducting coils, and the only one with the magnetic shielding. I would like to acknowledge these people. Uh, uh, Mike Monkenbush was the, the principal designer of this uh, instrument. Dieter Richter was the head of the institute who, who, who built uh, the, the, uh, the, the spectrometer. Laura and Malcolm and Weiren are, are instrument scientists on, on, on our beamline. Georg, as I said, he's the world expert uh, on magnetic uh, spin echo scattering. And these people who are 
were part of the Spinaco team, but they are, they are either back in Europe or, uh, yeah, back in Europe. Um, in the end, I would like just to point out to the literature, I would really start if you're, if, I mean, we just touched this, so, but if you want to really want to go deeper to this, I would really start with Roger Penn. It's an online lecture. It's really good. I myself, uh, most helpful was this first paper by uh, Ferenc Mose from 72. Uh, that second, third item here is for what some people call a neutron Pineco Bible is just the lecture notes uh, uh, from 1980. And if you really read deeply into this, what we do is, you know, lots of things have been thought of and, 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 and uh, designed, you know, back in the 90s, you know, like the time of flight Spinnaker was already proposed by 1980, where it happened to be the first instrument that actually realized it. Uh, yeah, there's a bunch of other uh, references that you may find useful. I found them useful. And I guess with that, we're about on time, I guess, leaving some time for questions. Thank you. Oh, up here, yes. Sorry. Yes. We can. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Oh, sorry. The question was, if we what we measure is the phase difference, how can you tell if it's more than one phase difference? No, we can't. You, I told you it's 50 microns. What well, really amounts to that, you know, that we we we're back into echo uh, uh, condition, right? And that that BL value doesn't have to be. All it really matters is that you 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 rotate by two pi. So I guess the answer is we won't know. I mean, that, yeah. The, in, on the signal here, oh, sorry. Um, well, this one is good again, is it? Here, the phase difference is zero, or zero modulo two pi, right? Here is 90 degrees, here 180 degrees, and so on. So. Yes. Yes, uh, so as I said, generally speaking, uh, it's, it's an instrument that, that works probably best at the reactor. So the, 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 the one advantage that I could point out is that because we have, hello, uh, because we have this wide wave, so the question, sorry, is about advantages of a uh, neutron spin echo at a, at, a, at a pulse source. So we, we, we can take much wider, much broader wavelength band. Uh, which in itself it's not such a great thing, but those measurements see we have, um, I don't know, a dozen of different, so we, we can cover a, a Q range uh, in, in one spectrometer setting. So, you know, if we have enough statistics, we can divide the data. So these Qs are not very different from one another, but still, you know, that, that, uh, that measurement here kind of covers um, where is that? My show. That kind of covers that area. So we, 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 we were able to show the students, you know, that peak or in what we draw it is actually a deep dip, you know, so that you got it in one shot, I guess, you know, so that's, um, but yeah, your, your data reduction is more complicated. You can take higher uh, flags in this case, right? I guess because you take um, wider bandwidth. Yes. Uh, yes. Oh. So yeah. So the question is why the echo is uh, zero. I mean, so these are not perfect. You know, the the the, the difference here in current is you know milliamps. So you just tune them. I guess you know it's not. But that's why we why we do the the scan we do right you know here actually in this case 
uh, if you're a careful observer, is that we're almost pushed it too far. <laughs> so we, you know, the, 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 the symmetry point is not, not close to zero, but you know, we're almost run out of room, I guess, on, on the left-hand side. It's just settings, yeah. Yes? Okay, that's, that if you, so the, the, the best way would be I would refer you to Squire's book because he works it out. This, these are these statistical weights. I, I assume that you guys had this uh, explained during one of your lectures, but in a nutshell, what it is is if it's a, hello, if it's a coherent scatter, like say deuterium, predominantly coherent, whenever, whenever the, the neutron spin is before the scattering and after scattering is the same, that means no spin flip. But if it's a incoherent scatter, you have this 30% chance, you don't know which one obviously, because that's stat statistical, so you have a 30% chance of spin flip, and uh, sorry, two, 30% chance of non-spin flip, and then uh, two-third chance of spin flip. Uh, it's just, I, I, there is a section in, in, in the Squire's book that I mentioned here that is explained more detailed, but uh, just uh, statistical uh, factors, I guess. That's, that's that. Uh, I can point you to a chapter. I have the book here, so if you come, I'll, I'll show you. 